Ladies and gentlemen, did you know that the average ELO of a person that plays chess is 375? I made that up. But about a year ago, I did a poll on this YouTube channel, and over 90% of viewers were rated from zero to about 1,200. And the reason that I'm telling you this is because in today's video, the average ELO of the opponents is 3,840. And that is because today I am showing you a game that was played between two chess bots in the recently concluded Chess.com Computer Championships. This was a rapid game played between Torch and Leela. And this game was ridiculous. You see, a lot of us like chess AI content. We like chess bot content. But we don't always like it when it's terrible. We prefer to watch it when it is absurdly high level. And I am happy to break it down for all of you. Here we go. Torch is rated 3,857, Leela 3,822. And this game began with C4. And every single time the bots play against each other, I say this time and time again. Anytime two bots are playing in a chess game, uh, they are pre-programmed to play certain moves. And the reason for that is two chess bots that are nearly 4,000 would just basically play the exact same openings over and over again to maximize their chances. So what they do is they make these bots play pairs of games in the same opening, one with white, one with black. So C4, black played E6. I will tell you uh, when the bots left their, their opening. This is an English opening. This is black playing E6 and probably building toward the center, but actually building this way. And now it's a Dutch defense. Anytime you respond to C4, D4, or Knight F3 with the move F5, it is known as the Dutch. If you respond to E4 with F5, it is known as the idiot opening. Uh, it's actually known as the Fred for some reason. I think this line where you lose all your pawns is known as the Fred Gambit. I don't know what, I don't know why. Anyway, knight to f6, white plays g3, bishop g2. This is all very normal stuff. This is exactly how you want to play in English because your light squared bishop and then your pawn on c4 will fight for the center. Black plays d5. So this approach, uh, chosen by the overlords uh, and ultimately by Leela, this is kind of a stonewall dutch. It's called a stonewall because it looks like a wall of stone. There you go. White plays b3. Not the most common move. It is far more common to play castles and then just normally play d4. But this move does two things. Number one, it defends the pawn. Number two, if black was to play a stone wall, because there are so many pawns on light squares, it is very normal for white to try to trade that bishop. That is kind of called the meta strategy of the entire opening, and you would play bishop to a3. So actually, white's approach with b3 could come, uh, you know, it, it, it could end up coming back to create some, you know, good things. Uh, at the same time, this type of approach by black would allow black to very quickly attack the center. So there's a lot of intricacies. None of that matters because Leela puts the knight on c6. We have bishop b2, bishop e7, both sides castle. And now we have left the opening book. So it's taken us a couple of minutes, uh, but we're gone. We, we, have, uh, we have departed uh, known theory. And um, I just realized that my streaming software that I use uh, recently went through an update, and now I can't even tell if this video is recording or not. So that's pretty cool. I hope it's recording. I mean, I hope, do, do I exist? Do, 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 can you see, uh, can you see me? Fascinating. I love when software updates and it's just like a complete disaster. Anyway, white plays d3. So Torch in this position doesn't play d4, doesn't, op you know, doesn't block the diagonal, and instead is just kind of hanging out in this position. And so the very first move that Leela makes on her own, on its, you know, Le Leela strikes me, that's a cool name. I feel like people are going to name daughters Leela. This just sounds like a cool, maybe there's like some origin or something. I don't know. It's a cool name though. A4. Leela plays A4. And the idea of a4, it's actually very normal to sacrifice your h and a pawns when the result would be a damaging of your opponent's pawn structure. It's very normal to do stuff like this, especially when you haven't castled that way. If you have a rook behind your pawn, it is a very normal thing to do. Uh, Torch takes in the center and then takes like this. And I think Torch did that because Torch knew black would not take with the queen because that would walk directly into the bishop. Black also wouldn't take with the pawn 
because then this knight would not get active. So Torch kind of like anticipated this would happen and basically says, okay, Leela, well, I'm up a pawn now. I mean, you gave me a pawn, sure, you damaged my structure, sure, but I'm up a pawn. So, good luck, right? Queen d6. With the simple idea of at some point walking over here and ultimately winning this pawn. Queen d6 is a really dumb looking move because it, it just walks right into this bishop move. But actually, black wants to go here. And it's really difficult to do something. You can't slide your pawn over to c3. Pawns don't go laterally. And it, the more you do you know, black's going to play c5. Black's just going to block that position, walk over here, take this, and suddenly your bishop becomes a target. Like, it wasn't even... You know, it wasn't even doing anything on that square. So instead of that, we play a3. Torch decides I'm going to play a3. I'm going to prevent anything from going to b4. Leela plays rook d8. Activates the, the rook alongside the queen. The knight is going to move. The bishop might go to f6 to trade off for that bishop. Very complicated game. Very complicated. Very tense. So at this point, anticipating that black is going to try to take some space in the center, anticipating that a bishop trade is coming, Torch plays d4. This move takes away squares from these pieces and also prevents bishop f6 from being an exchange. So it takes some space. Torch wants to go knight d2, knight c4, put the knights on e5, and, and, and go ahead. So bishop f6. Now, you asked me in this position why Torch did not play knight bd2. I can't tell you. But I think it has something to do with the fact that black would play knight b6, stopping knight c4, and also attacking the pawn. I think that's why... Torch did not play that. Instead, Torch played a move rookie one, which I can't really explain to you. Uh, I don't really think that it wants to put its rook in the center of the board and also destabilize its center, but what do I know? Now Leela kind of runs out of ideas, and Kier plays a move that Stockfish doesn't like. I like this. It's like Leela, Stockfish, and Torch all debating different things. Stockfish thinks it's time to play knight b6. It thinks it's time to go over this pawn. Leela, for some reason, plays h6. So clearly, it did not like making any committal decisions yet. So it plays h6. Queen c2. All right. Looking for knight d2, looking for knight c4. Knight c e7. That's a weird... Why are we... But why? What's the plan? Why are we playing knight e7? Well, the plan is actually to trade the queen. That's the plan, is that Leela, despite being a pawn down, is like, well, if we trade, nobody can protect the pawn on a4. The pawn that I gave as an investment a couple of moves ago. These engines, they make these positional decisions, right? So Torch puts its queen on b1. They make these, like, really obscure retreating moves, patiently awaiting the next phase of the game. And the thing with these computers is you, you just, you, you never know when they're going to when they're going to make a pawn break. And, and by the way, that pawn is now completely unprotected. Completely. And finally, Leela. What? Why did it play Rook F8? It, Stockfish thinks Rook F8 is also the best move. What? Why? 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 Why are we playing Rook F8? Can so I... What? I can't explain it. I think Leela knows that if it takes... White is going to play for e4, and after pawn takes, knight takes, it prefers to take this with the rook, but in this version, white doesn't actually have to take the bishop and could do something else. So instead of that, it's like, I can take this any time, and I'm going to play rook f8 because I anticipate that this is the only move, which it is, by the way. Torch completely agrees with that. <laughs> so they completely see the future together. And it immediately puts this here, and even here, it doesn't take the pawn on a4. Why is it not taking the pawn on a4? I don't know. I don't know. I, I can't explain some of these things. I, I don't quite get it myself. Now, this idea to come back and come back for the, you know, and come back and take the bishop, both computers are completely in agreement. This is the right thing to do for both sides. So... The incredible thing about chess at beginner level and even intermediate level, even advanced level, you think you're playing in a way that your opponent won't see. Isn't that incredible? Like, you think you're going to find ideas your opponent doesn't see. Engines see everything. How can there be a winner and a loser if both sides see everything? Evaluation. Not all computers agree with each other, all right? And so in this position, Torch plays a move... I can't even fathom. I don't even, like, if I ask you what is the most natural move in this position, 
y'all are all gonna say knight e5 because you're gonna lose this pawn anyway so you might as well activate the knight and activate the bishop i would play knight e5 if you thought knight e5 you and i are the same chest strength and i've been playing 20 years and i'm an international master so knight e5 is yeah that's a pretty good move yeah yeah uh, torch plays a5 It just decided that losing this pawn was better on its own terms. It prefers that black either moves the rook to that square for some reason, or black does this. Now, the incredible thing is, if black splits these pawns apart, the evaluation goes from 0.5 to 0.9. Why? Isn't that incredible? Half, nearly half a pawn more if the pawns are split. If that doesn't teach you a mini lesson in the importance of pawn structure, keeping your pawns together, right? Not creating these isolated pawn weaknesses of which black would have three. That, that There's nothing that can teach you, right? So it gives up the pawn like this. Now we play knight, a, knight, knight to e5. Now the queen moves to a4. And now the bots begin a dance. Sometimes in a position among two chess computers, there is no clear path forward. There's no clear path. Now, for us humans, we make our own path, and it's a flawed path. I mean, we, you know, we trample in the woods, we burn down the trees, like, we, we try to build a path when there's no path to build. Computers don't do that. They're very precise. It's like AI, right? It's like exactly what it is. So now, Torch goes here. Leela puts this, the other knight on f5. Everything in Leela's position that's important is protected. Everything is protected. The bishop's not protected, but it can't be attacked. So we play rook c1 targeting the pawn, but it's protected. Bishop b7. Now, you may look at this and go, well, this is easy. I take this, and then I take the... Yeah, okay, try that. So bishop takes, right? Okay, bishop takes, now rook takes c7. Terrific. That looks completely accurate. Except Torch doesn't want to lose its bishop. It evaluates in relative terms. This is not a three-point bishop, and that is not a three-point knight. It thinks this bishop is worth maybe four points. And it does not want to land in a position with so many weaknesses. Again, as a human, you know, maybe bishop a8... I'm not, saying, I'm not saying that's the best move. That's why it's plus two. But I'm just saying what might happen is queen d5, and all of a sudden, as a human, you are going to get mated. That's what's going to happen. I'm just, just, putting out, just showing you what, what, what it thinks, which is why it plays bishop f3, I guess. Okay, bishop f3, bishop d1. Maybe, maybe that way. What, I don't know. Queen b5, offering a queen trade. Offering a queen trade. Okay, no queen trade. Okay, queen goes back to e2. Queen e2. Queen e8, queen e2. Knight back to d6. And now Torch attacks on the same side. It takes a little bit of space. All right, it restricts its opponent. It decides, okay, pawn is good on h4. It's not really weakening my king. Black plays rook b5. Black is rock solid. Now, officially, every piece in Black's position is protected. Literally. Every single piece has protection. Bishop g2 back. You know when you're going bishop g2 back, you don't have a plan, okay? Rook b3, taking a little space away. Bishop f1, what, it, what are we doing? We, we setting up for the... All right, so we're going to put that there. We're going to put that there. We, we're just setting up for the next game. Rook goes back to b5. That's basically offering a draw. Queen c2, okay. Rook back to a5. <laughs> I mean, we're basically playing snake. It's like boop, 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 right? Rook a5. Bishop d3, okay, it seems like that was the idea. All right, but there's no target, so I don't really know what we're trying to do. The rook goes back to a7. I can't explain that move. The knight goes to g4. Okay, that big, we attack the rook. I can, okay. All right, I get it. We're trying to double up. We're trying to attack the pawn. Makes a lot of sense. Bishop just defends. All right, well, now dab, d doubling the pawn doesn't do anything. So now we put the knight back into the middle. Well, you know, we put the knight back into the middle. And rook, yeah, rook goes back to f6. Knight goes to g4. Rook goes to f8. We repeat moves one more time. Now we put the knight back to e5. Basically, Torch, at this point, because it has a limited amount of time to play the game. It's playing a rapid game, which is 10 minutes. It is trying to set up the optimal setup. It's trying to put its pieces on the optimal squares to ultimately go and create a threat. And it will find a way through. Rook f6, knight g4. It's not going to repeat. Puts the rook out. It's going to try to sacrifice it, maybe. Okay, queen is going to c1. I'm looking at stuff over here. That looks very appetizing. Queen f7. Nice idea. If you sacrifice now, I'm not going to take. You get a dynamite strike directly to the jaw. King h1, and now the absolutely brutal... Oop, I accidentally selected with the right click. Bishop b7, look at that. And that, the knight is about to move, and you will perish. So queen f7. It goes back to play defense. Now black gets a little bit more active. Now the knight goes back to the middle. Now the rook comes back, because the knight left. Now we go queen c2, queen back to e8. And now, 
the key idea. The key idea is shown right now. Bishop c1. Now, this is the optimal setup. The bishops play like this. And at this point, Stockfish decides you gotta trade pieces. Stockfish wants a trade of bishops to relieve some of that pressure. But here, Stockfish thinks that white can still create an attack with those pawns. If you can launch pawns like this in front of your king successfully for an attack, it's really bad news for the opponent. But none of that happens because here Leela plays queen a4. It tries to trade the queens. And queen d2, knight g4. This is a very bad sign. One, two, three pieces pointed all over there. I think you know what's coming. And in this position, Torch sacrifices the knight, ripping open the black position. Whenever computers sacrifice material, you know bad things are about to happen. Pawn takes h6. Queen takes h6. What? Wait a minute. So Torch sacrifices a knight and a bishop. The bishop is completely sacrificed. It's completely hanging. Wait a minute, though. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Not quite. Not quite, because there's queen g6 check, and then you would win the... No, wait, it absolutely is. You're about to find out. In this position, black can also play rook f7, but that's a lame move. Rook takes d3. Queen g6, king h8. Yeah, and now um, you can take the rook, but there's one problem. If you take the rook, you will lose one back. You will, you will lose a rook back. You're going to lose one of the pieces of the attack. Now, there is queen g6, and apparently white can still attack, but black also doesn't have to play bishop a6. Black can get back with the queen and start playing defense. So the idea of white was not just to sacrifice the knight and not just to give away the bishop. It was also to give away the rook. So Torch sacrifices the knight, the bishop, and doesn't take the rook back and gives away its own rook. Torch is now down three points of material. It's got a few pawns. It's got three pawns. But it's about to lose the rook as well. Bishop takes e6. Rook takes e6. Not even a check. Not even a check. You did not even take it with a, to, to make the king move. Instead of that, I guess knight f7 was possible. Rook e6. And the threat in this position, the threat like let's say black plays b5, is to slide over and deliver a ladder checkmate in either order. So you got to act now. Queen to d1, the counterattack begins. King h2, and now as a display of counterplay, Leela finds the only way to defend itself, and that also is to sacrifice the rook. Rook takes g3 is the only move. Everything else is like plus 7. This is plus 0.5. And that stops rook g6. But more importantly, it either opens the king on the second rank to checks, or you walk into a fork. And the engines are not going to do that. They're not going to lose their queen. So rook takes g3, stops everything, and not just stops everything, that's checkmate. So black sacrifices the rook to open up white's king, threatens a checkmate, forces pawn takes, and now you cannot take the bishop because it's protected, but you can give a check. And by giving a check, you will force the king to be defended. Bishop to d2. The craziest thing about this position is that rook is now in the crosshairs as long as this king gets out of the way. So black's king walks courageously up to f7. Queen g6 is covered. Rook e7, taken. Rook f6, defended. So there is actually no way that white can coordinate these pieces. A lot of human beings here would lose the game. They would because they have no attack. They've just gone fully down a knight, rook to e2. You can get more reinforcements with rook f2, but it seems like there's just going to be a belligerent attack coming back your way. Queen f5 and the attack looks over. You can't play rook e5, you get hit with queen f2. You can't do anything, but you can. By the way, you stepped out of the way and you're sacrificing the other rook. So black is ready to sacrifice both rooks to survive the attack. Both rooks gone for a pawn and a bishop. That's a six-point turnaround, right? You got a bishop back, and you got a pawn back. You sacrifice a rook for a pawn, you sacrifice a rook for a bishop. That's four for ten. But at least you don't get mated, and at least you make it into an endgame. And that kind of happens in this game, because Torch goes here, trying to deflect the queen off the f-file, right? And deflect the queen off this diagonal to give a check, give another check, and trade the queens 
and the apocalypse is over and we are in this endgame. This is fascinating stuff. So now we have two knights, pawn, pawn, versus rook, and three pawns. What the heck is going on? How did all the pieces fall off the board? Where are the pieces, right? Well, white is going to try to win this game by using what we call the outside pass pawns. All of that happened. Black sacrificed both rooks. White sacrificed knight, rook, and bishop exploding the position. And now we go here. Remember how a long time ago I told you in this position, splitting the pawns is very bad. Well, fast forward to the end game. Oops, fast forward to the end game. Look, we have that same split pawn structure. If black did not have to take the bishop, like let's say it was this, uh, it was, uh, I'm gonna just make, let's say knight b7, rook d2, knight takes a5. Look at the evaluation. It's zeros. But because black has to take the pawn like that, with the pawn like this, this is losable. And Torch here closes its eyes and sees 4,092,000 possibilities or whatever Doctor Strange said in that movie because I can't remember. Rook to e5. And this is the major problem, the pawn. If you play c6, you weaken that. You make it even worse for yourself. So, knight f4, rook takes a5. And now, these knights are going to have to make a defensive blockade. Knight to f5 is securing a pawn. You're going to win one of the pawns back. White plays a4. The closer that pawn gets to promotion, the better it's going to be for white to play this endgame. Now, let's remember, in every single endgame, it's like fractions. You remember fractions in school? Some of you are still studying fractions in school because you're like seven. Simplification. If we get rook versus knight, it's a draw. If we get rook and pawn versus knight, it's winning. If we get rook and pawn versus knight and pawn, it depends where the pawns are. Rook has really good winning chances, but you could accidentally draw the game. So it's all going to come down to whether the pawns survive. And now white only has two remaining. Rook g5 check from Torch. Making the king make a decision. But more importantly, winning the tempo. In chess, it's all about winning the tempo. Playing the game on your terms. Rook to g4 is a very important move. Now you do two things. Number one, you cut off the king from the rest of the board. Number two, you force the knights to tie their shoes together. I don't know why horses are wearing shoes. King to g3. That's a winning threat. The threat is to take. The threat is to get rid of both knights. This pawn can't be stopped. This pawn can be stopped. So black goes. Knight h5. The white king walks closer to the center of the board. It's really bad news. Knight f6. Rook goes here. Cutting off this knight's access. a5, a6, a7, a8 is on the way. Black has to scamper back to, to defend. Knight d7. Knight d7 is a really tough move, by the way. It's never too late to blunder a fork in an endgame, which is why we slide back. Now black is in a tough spot. White right now is threatening rook c6. So for example, king g6, you would play a5, rook c6, black can't move any pieces. And then you would play h5, you just can't. It's the worst two pawns to play defense against, especially if you have a knight. So c5, rook e4, targeting the knight. Where's the knight gonna go? Is this knight gonna play passive defense? You can't, then you can't stop the pawn. So the knight tries to be active. Now you go a5. Now the pawn is three squares away from queening. Black's time is running out. Knight goes back to b8. Black is looking for a defensive fortress with the knight on c6, but the rook targets the pawn. The pawn can't be protected. You can't defend the pawn, both knights, and the a pawn. c4. That is so important. You could have tried to play rook c5 in this position, then I would have went c3. And I would have used the tactical defense with this fork to save my pawn. And if you try to walk in, now the pawn is too close to queening. Now the rook has to defend the pawn. The rook cannot go and target the other knight. If I go rook c8 threatening this, oops. Oops! Which is why in this position, after c4, you have to attack the knight first! You have to make the knight make a decision. Do you go back to defend the pawn in the knight? Do you come forward? What are you gonna do? You go back. Now I play a6. Now you can't take, because rook d6 is a fork. You also cannot protect the c-pawn anymore. The knight goes back to a7. And now I play rook c5. And the worst part about this is that I am not actually threatening the pawn. I am actually threatening, if knight a6, this 
That is the dagger. The fact that you needed to defend yourself stacking on the A file. My threat is on the pawn, but the bigger threat is on your knights. King g6, and this will literally be decided by one pawn. Rook c4, the knight has to go here. Now white goes rook c5, and it's just a matter of which way will the king commit. Will the king go to the h pawn? Will the king go to the a pawn? And white cannot win this game without the true hero of the moment, which is the king. So the truth is, if white, if white was told right now, you, you can't touch the king, white it can't win, because it's a, it's a blockade. It's a complete blockade. You're not going to get these pieces out of there, which is why the winning idea here would be to play something like king. But rook d7 is a flex. Rook d7 is just mean. The idea of rook d7 is to give away the pawn. Like, Torch has a sense of humor. It's like, take my pawn, leaving me with one pawn, and then king f4. King g6, king e4. King f6, king d5. You can't get any closer. The king is blocked out. Can't get any closer. You can't move anything. Can't move the knight because I take that knight. Can't move this knight because I take that. You can give me a check. King c4. You can't give me another check. If this, rook a7, knight b8, the knight is trapped. If it goes here or here, rook b7. I mean, how brutal is that? That you get this close, but now your knight cannot escape the edge of the board. Brutal. Which is why, king g5 h7, and the game is over. I make a queen, and the fastest way to checkmate, swarm the king with checks, and rook d7 is the delivery of the checkmate. What a game, what a fascinating battle between these two bots, where white shuffled, looked for the optimal setup to crack the black position, and ultimately lined up the pieces in a menacing formation, sacrificed the knight, sacrificed the, the bishop, Sacrifice the rook, and then how about how, can we give some props to Leela as well? Sacrificing its own rook to play defense, and a little bit later, sacrificing another rook to extinguish the attack. But unfortunately, it was too little too late as the rook managed to win the only pawn weakness and utilize the outside pass pawns uh, to uh, to win the game. And 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 I just wonder, like, at what point the bots knew that those pawns would play a pivotal role in this game. I, I really just. That's what blows my mind. That's what fascinates me, and, and I don't know. I have absolutely no idea, and I find that totally fascinating. So uh, that's all I have for you today. Get out of here.